So yeah, I was I was thinking of like where to go with this because you've done other shows before, but I think like briefly, not even briefly, like as as much as you want to go into on your start, obviously, where your interest started, how you got specifically into like a very niche area of like the land race heirloom older lines, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah. And we have questions from people in our discord and oh. I want to talk some of the lines obviously that you carry so you can shine some light on some of those too. Plus I'm interested in a lot of them and I have a bunch. So yeah. 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 Nice. Um, yeah. Uh, well, that's cool that people have sent in questions cause it's always good to sort of yeah. answer that for people. Cause often, often I sort of don't realize the extent I mean, I do, I do because people mention it, but you know, when people come to the site and they're a bit overwhelmed by the sheer quantity of stuff on there and things like that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, um, for, for, for me, it was uh, something that, uh, that getting into this sort of niche, as it were, was more um, the growing up in the UK in the 90s. Yeah. Um, some of my, well, in fact, all of my first encounters with cannabis were through uh, stuff that friends of mine's parents had, you know, so sort of boomer generation people who would still in that era go and, you know, to Nepal and places and bring back stuff to smoke and that kind of thing. And then the people who I was talking to it about, talking to about it were, also of that generation and would sort of regale me with anecdotes about smuggling hash back from Afghanistan and this type of thing, you know? So, so that kind of triggered your interest. Um, yeah. I mean, that was my perspective on it was that that was the, the real cachet, the real kind of, um, you know, um, mythologized stuff was that old, old type of old school cannabis, you know, that was anyway, what I was kind of raised, it, the context in which I grew up into cannabis was one in which that was always had the biggest sort of prestige attached to it. You know, sure. these were these old kind of like um, hippie type characters, you know, like um, it's probably a slightly, I mean, they definitely were back in the sixties, but hmm. um, that those, you know, they were doing the hippie trail and stuff and, yeah. and doing kind of scams like that. And then and as teenagers, we would occasionally like, you know, I'm talking kind of very early nineties and things, but obviously being so close to Amsterdam in England anyway, yeah. you um, do, we were seeing that um, people were starting to, to grow, but it wasn't the indoor, indoor kind of domestic production in the UK didn't really take off in a big way until the late nineties, early two thousands. And suddenly in the space of a couple of years, imported cannabis just disappeared from the UK completely. So most imports anyway, if you're in the UK, unless you knew someone were pretty mm -hmm. fucking shit Moroccan hash, to be honest, throughout that era. <laughs> but if you didn't know someone, you could get, you know, nice Swazi red, sort of West African, oh, Nigerian, wow. and you could still get good, good Moroccan and you'd see Lebanese, you'd see very seldom see like really good Afghan, it, to, to get that, you'd need to go to Holland or someone somewhere to actually find someone who could get the real stuff. Because most of what most of the Afghan, Pakistani type hash by that point that you'd see in the UK was bunk, even though people didn't seem to realise, you know. Yeah. But um, but uh, anyway, so uh, but if we did if we did see like what we would call skunk and that kind of stuff in the early nineties, we'd sit. You know, I'd sit with my friends at, around at their house and stuff and their parents would just be like, Oh, this stuff's terrible. Why are you fucking touching mm -hmm. all this crap? You know? And they just give us this kind of lecture about how awful it is and stuff. And, um, so that was kind of my perception anyway. And then also, you know, friends of mine who are Australians would basically had the same attitude. It's like if they came around and they saw, and these again, older generation, you know, if they saw us growing things, it'd be like, Oh, these aren't pure sativas. You need like proper sativas and they'd rave about Thai and, Indonesian and Papua New Guinean sativas and stuff, you know, so always my perspective anywhere was that. So for me, it was just, that was the natural thing to be interested in. And when I did start trying to grow for myself, I sort of had this realization, fucking hell, like I know where all these places are, 
I want these seeds and I can see online that all these other people are wanting these seeds. I know where to go to go yeah. and get them. And um, so it's just a kind of natural progression, really. It just, um, you know, uh, it all kind of fell into place. Um, yeah, that takes, that takes yeah. connections, like to to track down like legitimate stuff. And, and you seem to be a, quite a well-read historian of cannabis. And um, yeah, I can't imagine the links that you've had to go to 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 even to, to bring out a lot of this old stuff and a lot of the the land race stuff as well. Um, I would say it's sort of partly become possible because of spending enough time in these places that um you get to know people and they trust you enough you know yeah but it, yeah it sort of, um, uh, it, it really varies though because some some bits of some bits of the um of asia anyway it, it's not really that you need particularly to have connections you just need to know where the places are you know yeah so um you know you can you can go to this as long as you know where the places are in a lot of in a lot of the more central asian parts it's actually quite a lot easier because it's it's really the tropics where it's more tricky because there's no reason to have seeds in the tropics other yeah. than to grow sensimila you know it's not like their food or something like in nepal some of the land race types anyway are, are, as much as anything are cultivated for the seeds, you know? Yeah. So there are some areas where, and, and the same actually is kind of true in, in even in um, uh, the Hindu Kush, you know, is the seeds are a winter food source as well. So you could, oh, no yeah, yeah, yeah. People, this is a really overlooked uh, thing actually, like even amongst the yeah. experts, people seem to realize that cannabis is a multi-purpose crop in all of the Northern areas. Like including Afghanistan and the Hindu Kush, the only bit where it's not a multi-purpose crop is in the tropical areas where where it's ganja, which is sensimila, semi sensi whatever you want to call it. Yeah. That's the only bit where it's a single-purpose crop. It is only grown for producing the buds. You know, I guess um, that makes where, sense too with the hash, with the hash production and stuff, because they can still collect the hash and harvest the seeds. Yeah, yeah. So you know, um, sometimes it like. Um, I've read people like David Watson, Sam Skunkman saying, yeah. you know, oh, we tried really hard to um, persuade the Afghans to like grow the crop as Sinsamila and like they just mm -hmm. actually just weren't interested. And there's a pretty good reason for that, which is that actually the seeds are in a very important winter food source. They're very high in, you know, fats. important fats yeah. and proteins as well. And, and in, particularly in the mountains, that's really necessary because obviously you can't keep like huge herds of animals very easily in in the mountains you can have a few cows and goats and stuff but it's not like um there's a there's a there's a huge demand for land and water and everything in in, the, in, in, in any mountain area and so, so you know if you can have that extra source of protein and fats it's it's pretty essential actually you know i would Especially think like some of the Mideastern places would be super hard to uh, make those connections, especially nowadays. Um, I remember hearing even Neville's story back with, um, I think, Clive. I think that's what he goes by. Um, when they went to, I think it was Afghanistan, and one of them OD'd <laughs> in a hut, and they were, you know, trying to kick in their door and whatnot. That was, that's how the story went anyways. So I can only imagine how crazy it is to try to get inroads in there nowadays with the political climate. Um, I mean, one thing one thing I'd pick up on first is just in terms of thinking about the geography of cannabis. Um, Afghanistan, I think if you if you want to have a kind of clear, uh, or just because I think it's really helpful, you know, with with everything is like context is everything, and and Absolutely. for cannabis, it's really good to get the geographical. And cultural context kind of on a basic kind of map in your mind as it were and sure. i would say afghanistan is best thought of as like southern central asia so central asia rather than the middle east is how i would okay. talk about it in this terms because it's um that's the really central you know in what we call indicas in the sort of loose sense colloquial sense yeah. are a central asian domestica basically and, and uh, 
So Afghanistan is really sort of the southern edge of Central Asia. And um, rather than the Middle East, I think if you, is it, is Middle East is slightly more sort of confusing. It is kind of confusing either. term, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because, um, you know, it connects, Afghanistan really sort of connects in a cannabis sense with Xinjiang and places like that, which is Eastern Central Asia. Yeah. Bukhara is sort of really, you know, Central Central Asia, as it were. And, and those are all historically very connected, important cannabis centers in terms of the sort of indica type yeah. uh, races. Um, but yeah, going to those places, um, yeah, I mean, it's been, it's been increasingly difficult, um, especially with the uh, Taliban being allowed to kind of yeah. retake the entire place and stuff. But um, yeah, and you know, there is also, yeah, the fact that other, definitely one thing I found going to those bits of the world is that the, the culture of kind of opium and stuff does um, mix with the cannabis culture quite a lot. Yeah. And I definitely met characters who were having problems with things like, you know, harder substances like oh, heroin right. and things. Yeah. But, um, the, yeah, I mean, it's, there's, there's various ways to do these things. I mean, some of the people who were helping us for a while were, 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 were stringers for, for media, um, and journalism. In fact, all of the people I know who are sort of from these places who were, 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 were working as stringers and, uh, which means sort of helping, um, you know, j journalists and media companies who, who want to make productions in those areas to, to meet the people, find the right places to, doing that oh, kind of job. And then they would um, just have a sideline in, in like helping collect seeds for us, basically, you know. And then obviously once the, once the, um, the, the um, Biden sort of pulled the plug on air support for, and tech support and everything yeah. for the Afghan army and it just got overrun and most of them had to then um, spend the next sort of, you know, half a year in like safe houses trying not to get executed. <laughs> yeah, it's not great. It gives you a different perspective on these things because everyone's sort of like, I mean, because like, you know, I don't want to get detour too far into politics, but I, I sort of thought the whole, that whole, um, post 9-11 adventure was just completely misguided, but it's like once they've actually committed to it, to then just suddenly fucking turn around and say, actually, you know what, fuck that, we're just gonna leave and not even tell you. Yeah. Was yeah. just a just an ex astonishing fucking betrayal, but everyone yeah. was expecting it, so. It's America, um, man, that's what they do. <laughs> it's yeah, awful, it's but it, it is. Between, between extremes, there's no sort of, it just seems to be incapable of finding a kind of sensible middle ground on foreign policy to us. It's yeah. always going one way or the other too far. It's like, oh, we don't want nothing to do with it. Oh, we're all in. Oh, we want nothing to do with it. Oh, we're all in. It's like, Jesus, man, just fucking, you know, it's just an insane mechanism that seems to fucking infect all the thinking about it. But, Leaving yeah. all the caches of weapons and whatnot too, just to find their, their homes to wherever. Yeah, it's fucking do something with Ukraine the way it's going. So yeah, it's just yeah. gift them the entire fucking. Um, anyway, but yeah, um, it's it's it's. Um, but yeah, so yeah, I mean that's that's mostly what I've seen of it is the the post nine eleven kind of version of the hippie trail. So it is quite hard to avoid the political aspects of it because it, the landscape is so transformed. By the time I got to see most of it, like it. You know the context in which I saw people smoking a lot were like um, security guards and sort of yeah, you know sort of those kind of characters like sitting around like with like you know guns and stuff outside places like embassies and hotels and whatever uh, you know very publicly smoking hash and things. It's like there's sort of there's a whole um, martial kind of militant not mil militant you know. Um, warfare type context of cannabis use there and things that yeah. I start to realize, yeah, it's not just a sort of, um, the, the hippie trail 
stereotypes of sort of spiritual use and things are actually just one side of the the culture of cannabis there's whole ranges of, of ways it's used traditionally that aren't necessarily part of the main western discourse of like oriental cannabis culture you know yeah um, see, that's that's part of the story that fascinates me because it's it's a lot of the stuff that even as deep into cannabis history and stuff as i am that's like not something i'm really super familiar with so i don't speak on it you know i don't know it but you're the type of person that i can speak to that has a lot more insight into that and i think uh the more people are able to see all these different perspectives um different ways of thinking about how it's been used maybe ways they've never even considered you know i think that's really important to talk about yeah i think it's like i think everyone you know we all kind of want to uh kind of know what the roots of the plant are and where it's come from and things um but there's definitely been a tendency in in sort of the right on in in a lot of the writing about it to to favor this idea that it's um uh, to, to favor aspects of it that fitted with the sort of historical moment of the 60s when it really became a mass phenomenon in the west you know which was yeah mostly sort of the anti-war anti-racist um and sort of countercultural uh, aspects that were emphasized all those things like you know the assassins and stuff did kind of creep in there because that was already talked about quite a lot in yeah. sort of orientalist myths of or legends or whatever so you know that and that does go into the martial context of use and stuff as well yeah. one one thing i thought we should go over early on too because yeah. uh i mean the nomenclature is important and and even even this far in like i don't feel confident anymore like trying to say what i think a land race is versus an heirloom versus you know anything else um I'd love right. to have your your actual working definitions of some of these things as we talk about it, so people understand what we're talking about when we say land race and heirloom varieties. Yeah, yeah, sure. It's always a good idea. Yeah, it's just yeah, complete fucking minefield of like different terms. That, uh, so, so I mean, la land race is just a really unfortunate word from my perspective. That was mm -hmm. a translation that was made in the sort of late nineteenth, early late nineteenth century from various european languages into english from german terms danish terms whatever like land in german it would be landrasse that was translated okay. into english as land race um whereas actually if you were to do that translation these days land race would be best translated as country breed or something like that oh, so it's yeah so it's a defunct form of the word race that we just don't use anymore it's completely archaic now in english yeah. but it, it was it, 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 race did once to, in english have the meaning of breed as in a created something that someone has bred has created like a crop or a, a breed of animal you know sure. so 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 land races are uh artificially selected they're creations by humans for products that we want they're created in certain areas by farmers so they, they have a, an element of region being region specific and, and cultures but they're culture specific and they're absolutely creatures of human desire and whatever so they're, they're things that farmers have created for certain products so all land races are product specific so the um tropical land races are, are specific for and we're talking drug quote you know air quotes drug cannabis yeah here. so tropical land races from places like india southeast asia are all specifically for uh sensamila slash semi sensi as in ganja is the traditional term for this like it's the seedless inflorescences or, or you know very lightly seeded yeah uh, it should be like that and then that product goes back to at least the 15th century perhaps as early as the 12th century in india you can find sanskrit literature that describes that technique of roguing out the males cutting down the males how to maximize resin production by certain cultivation techniques and so on so jesus so what we call sativas are you know they're those are what we call sativas so the tropical land races narrow leafleted yeah um, high thc because they've got this uh, long history of individual plant selection that's 
enabled by keeping the seed from a batch of good ganja, you know, because yeah. in practice, uh, farmers don't, you know, you, you can find uh, genuinely 100% sinsamila. It is still around even these days in, in places like India and Laos and Thailand and stuff. But for the most part, you, you if you buy a, a, a batch of any significant size of ganja, you will find one or two seeds in there. If you're in, in, in India, you know, it it's, can be loads of seeds often, sure. you know. But um, it shouldn't be like that. And historically, it wasn't like that for the most part, you know. Um, That's amazing. But, but it goes back that far. I didn't know that. Then it went back to the 1200s yeah. with uh, selections. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, with, with um, cutting down, um, yeah, and, you know, so the, the the point the point is that individual plant selection is a is a strong selective pressure and that is enabled by that strong selective pressure is enabled by the fact that you do often find a, a seed or two in a batch of ganja that you would buy you know absolutely so consumers and aficionados and farmers are all able to do that so consciously or unconsciously you've got at least 500 years of individual plant selection being a factor in the creation of sativas which is why as any kind of aficionado knows they are the strongest forms of land races thai lao burmese south indian like kerala uh, all these types of plants are what went in to form the real kind of original haze yeah type sativas that people know in the states and you know back in the late 60s early 70s this was literally fetching multiples its weight in gold in terms of price by the time it got from from thailand to the west coast of the united states and it was the same in in england so if you look at the customs seizures records from the early 70s for, for for cannabis that was coming from places like isan in thailand it was like they were it was testing you know with thin layer chromatography but which is not hugely accurate but it was testing kind of 17 percent thc yeah and that's when not gaming the tests and it's probably sat in a warehouse in <laughs> london or right. for months never mind how long it took to get to england in the first place you know yeah so yeah, I mean, we're talking high levels of potency. So people aren't making it up when they say that this stuff could blow your head off, you know, yeah, even for sure. in the 60s and 70s. And to be honest, it doesn't, you don't need much more than 10% THC anyway. A lot of it's about the uh, other stuff that's in this, in these, uh, the other phytochemicals that are in these plants. Absolutely. But anyway, to, to stay focused. So there's the, those are the sativas. And then the, in the north, the main group is what people call colloquially indicas which uh the you know i guess everyone knows what i'm talking about broadly speaking but that, that, again this is a type of land race that um you know with the more semi-dwarf morphology used for making hash so product specific there's no culture of sensimila in north of 30 degrees latitude so once you've got to the north of Pakistan, there just is no, in fact, in fact, once you've even got to the Punjab in India or the Punjab in Pakistan, it's bisected mm -hmm. by colonialism. The, um, once you've got there, there's no culture of Sinsamila by the time you even get to the Punjab. Once you've gone north of the Punjab towards the foothills of the Hindu Kush, absolutely no Sinsamila culture at all. It's all hash and uh, it's always been that way. So when you make hash, you pull the seeds yeah. in the process of making the hash. So there just is not ever been, been much in the way of an, any individual plant selection on hash land races. So mm -hmm. they're a bulk selected crop that probably goes back millennia, perhaps mm -hmm. um, that bulk selection, which is why on balance, the, the, um, the the cannabinoid um, uh, characteristics of, 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 of indica land races do sort of lean slightly towards THC dominant um, plants like type one plants as people will call it but you do have in the population a mix of type one type two type three uh, so you know 
high ratio of THC to CBD as type one, balanced THC and CBD as type two, and then type three is sort of higher ratio of CBD to THC. So most hash land races yeah. will typically, if they're a pure land race, we're talking not a, you know, not Afghani number one or something you can buy yeah. off a Dutch um, seed bank. Um, if they're a real land race, they tend to be like that. They do lean slightly towards type one because they've had that history of bulk selection. It's, you know, more than random, more than random lean towards type one. But, um, uh, yeah, if, if you want to grow a crop of sensimilla from, from seed, it's not much use, uh, to, to, to use a, a, a real land race. You know, they need to be worked to, to make them a, since the Mila cultivar, you know, so if yeah. you were talking about the difference between an heirloom and a land race, heirloom is not a technical term as far as I know, but it, I would define it in the context of cannabis as uh, a, a land race that's been worked specifically for in, in, a, in a Western or modern context for since Mila. So X18 or Deep Chunk or Afghani number one, they're all in indica, indica heirlooms in the sense they're an indica land race that's been worked for making sense of me that, you know, yeah that's how i would define that it makes sense yeah yeah uh, what, and then you've got what, one other what group the feral really? varieties then like how, how would you define those in, in in terms of like land race heirloom is it its own type um, so um feral or kind of wild type is another term you could use that i think is quite good um there, um, you you don't find them much in the tropics. That, as as a, as a rule, cannabis doesn't naturalize uh, very well in the tropics. It's not uh, a species that is well adapted to that type of climate. So, if you do find if you do find feral um, cannabis in the tropics, it's because you're 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 at altitude somewhere with a fairly temperate climate. Um, so for the most part, if you were, if you're in, for example, India, you might find weedy, uh, cannabis growing like anywhere sort of north of the Ganges. So we're talking between in, in, in the sort of top half of North India, between the Ganges and the Himalayas, you know? Okay. And then as you go up towards the Himalayas, suddenly you'll find areas where it just grows fucking everywhere, you know, <laughs> like feral, just seas of feral stuff, especially if you go up into Pakistan, like Punjab fucking everywhere um uh and then up into the mountains around the rivers and places it, it, it anywhere where there's kind of disturbed land but it's basically uh as a species it's uh it's a step species meaning it, it likes kind of windy um fairly dry places where there's lots of disturbed land and it, it uh so it likes to grow along the sides of rivers where animals come to drink and shit and stuff mm -hmm. uh, so it likes high nitrogen uh lo decent amounts of water but not rainy you know um is, anyway is it lean it, cbd dominant for stuff like that um no um not necessarily so um basically they're kind of um like nobody knows where there's a pure, nobody's ever kind of satisfactorily identified like a pure wild, like unaffected by humans, pure wild cannabis plants has never been found, you know? That makes sense. So what you actually have is like parallel populations that have just been swapping genes with whatever the local form of cannabis is, you know? Mm -hmm. In a sense of like humans domesticated it at least, I don't know, kind of say 8,000 years ago, probably we started at least, you know, unintentionally domesticating cannabis yeah. and um, by just bringing it back to hunter gatherers, like bringing it back to places and where they were eating and stuff we like, we're unconsciously selecting for types that we liked, you know? Yeah. And then they were quite happy to grow around our campfires and stuff because there was lots of shit and discarded animal bones and stuff that just are good for yeah. cannabis. To so, um, um basically if you're in somewhere like the punjab where it grows uh, which is sort of north uh west india where 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 there's a lot of wild grand cannabis you can you can people do like crop the feral 
uh, weedy stuff, provided it's somewhere clean that's not dusty and things, you can just crop that and um, use it for making food and things, you know? Yeah. So these are high, high THC um, in, in the sense of uh, they will get you stoned, you know? It's, it, yeah. It, it's not like in um, places like, I don't know, Wisconsin or somewhere in the States <laughs> where it's, yeah. it's basically hemp that's gone feral, you know? Yeah, the fiber hemp um, varieties. <laughs> yeah, I mean, these are definitely, like, if we're talking, uh, I'll probably to make things confusing, but anyway, these are like, in in, 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 in those, in all of sort of Central and South, South Asia where you get feral populations, it's pretty much um, drug, drug type, quotes, yeah. cannabis. Yeah. And then in the Himalayas, like uh, people do sometimes hand rub the the feral populations for for charis, and mm -hmm. it makes what people sometimes call jungly charis, as in like wild charis. But actually, there's a again, this is one of those kind of hippie trail type confusions. There's been this assumption that Himalayan cannabis is always feral cannabis, which is it, which it isn't. Like yeah, ninety nine percent of the charis that's produced in the Himalayas every year is from domesticated, intentionally cultivated land races grown in fields by a farmer, you know? Yeah. This notion that it's, the Himalayan cannabis is, uh, is all wild and stuff is not, not accurate. Like in, in terms of the product is this very seldom produced from the, the wild weedy stands you can, and people do, but it's got way less resin production than the, the, the than the actual, land races do you know I'm sure. yeah and, and and it's useless for making uh since it's not because it's all going to be seeded anyway yeah. you, you can't use it for to smoke as bud it's just it's i mean you do see sadhus doing that i have seen sadhus like her uh, yogis wandering kind of yogi characters who've yeah. gone up to the himalayas and picked picked a whole load of uh, feral flowers and then they just sit and they kind of pick out the seeds and mix it with some tobacco and smoke it. But it's, it's not like it's, uh, you know, it's not, um, designed for that. Yeah. Just why people can rub it for charis. Cause it, it's time consuming to do, but you end up with a product that is actually going to get you stoned. Yeah. Whereas uh, smoking a whole load of feral bud like that mixed with tobacco, it's more just like a kind of, uh, maybe take the edge off whatever physical discomfort you experience as a, as a wandering yogi, but it's not going to like get you particularly high. I wouldn't have thought unless you really just happened to find an unusually strong plant. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. yeah. You know, um, one of the, the interesting things like from, from the American perspective, at least for mine, um, is trying like in my mind to define expressions between, uh, when people talk about, indica types specifically or the the broadleaf types um the differences between like an afghani type plant and a pakistani plant where the the overlap is and you know like there's always talk of chinese um broadleaf types and i i've never got my hands on any of those i remember someone made the yunnan available for a while but i never got to grow any um, I'd like to hear some of your insight on that and the, the major differences. And I know it's, it's kind of hard to generally speak on expressions from whole regions, you know, depending on the elevation. But is there anything that you've noticed between, um, say, Afghanistan and Pakistan in in how they grow um, scent expressions, anything like that? It, I mean, it's it's particularly difficult with um, those northern type Central Asian, you know, Afghan, Pakistani yeah. uh, uh, populations because what you get if you grow like a first generation of direct from those places, like seeds directly from a farmer in Pakistan or Afghanistan, whatever, there's a huge amount of variation within the population of one batch of seeds from one farmer. So the range of aromas that you're going to find in one field from plant to plant, just in one of those land races, it's extraordinarily diverse. You know, one plant might be really kind of like kind of candy shop, sweet, mm -hmm. tangy aromas. The next one might smell like a dog shit, you know, yeah. or whatever. And, and, and so it's particularly in those Northern populations, there's, 
because they're bulk selected, they're not as genetically narrow as tropical sativa yeah. populations are. So because they they haven't had they haven't you know the the genome hasn't been stepped on by farmers doing much in the way of very consciously intentionally directed breeding. There's a, a huge amount of variation anyway, and then yeah. I, on top of that, in terms of the difficulty of generalizing, you know, because the the assumption amongst aficionados is that precision more precision in in your description means more accuracy but actually if you get if you get too precise on these things you become less accurate you know yeah for sure for sure because there's vast amounts of diversity so particularly with cannabis because it's so phenotypically plastic so it because yeah. like i was saying it's a mountain uh species that's evolved um at altitude um to adapt to the huge climate shifts you get at altitude and that kind of thing, it can express itself very differently depending on where it's planted. So if you were to plant the same land race at sea level and then plant it at three and a half thousand meters, exactly the same batch of seeds from the same farmer, uh, you will see very different plant looking plants morphologically because you plant them up at higher altitude, they're gonna grow much shorter broad more broadly to, they're going to pump out way more resin yeah probably going to have different phytochemicals it's probably smell different and everything you know so yeah and likewise if you you can get that even with uh, tropical sativas if you grow them on well they're going to be amazing if you grow them incompetently they're not going to smell so good you know yeah um, it, it, and, it, you kind um, of have to go to point of origin to to experience them as they are uh, which uh, is yeah yeah i mean it definitely makes a vast difference even with the more genetically narrow populations like tropical sativas if they're grown well by someone who knows how to do it on the right type of land with the right irrigation timing the right feeding timing the right uh you know everything if you overwater a tropical sativa late in flower it's going to keep growing keep putting out buds and leaflets and it's going to be shit. yeah and, and no one and this is why you get all this bollocks talk about 30 weeks of tevas indoors and stuff it's just people just <laughs> yeah. keep on fucking watering it you know <laughs> so stop that feeding experience. It. <laughs> but anyway you know and, and if you look at the historical records it's always it will tell you this like uh, in the um 19th century documentation of, of the ganja farms in um, bengal and places it's like yeah the farmers yeah. always say worst thing that can happen is we get rains in like january february and it'll fuck up our whole crop because it will start shooting again yada oh, yada yada yeah anyway so it's all it's all there if, if, if you if you want to look and stuff and i have blogged about this on the on the site as well if people are wanting to go into more depth and you can find all the sources and stuff but um it's an uh, amazing blog by the way like it's <laughs> i've learned a lot <laughs> reading through it over the years Oh, that's good to know. I, I, I glad someone reads it. <laughs> yeah, I do. I mean, it's, uh, it's it's how I how I um like came to know you without speaking to you a bunch was through the blog right, right. And, and seeing the passion and how you write and how in depth the detail was and and over time learning how accurate it was, which is the most important. You know, yeah. Well, it's so, good to hear, man. Thanks. I, I appreciate it. I I've shifted most of it now to the actual main website blog rather than the sort of um independent blog because uh, it just seems to make more sense so generally yeah. i've been kind of moving everything over to the main blog on the site now just because uh, it seems to make more sense but I, I, I before i lose the thread of what you were originally asking um so in terms of pakistan versus afghanistan so the thing to bear in mind is like um seeds move around a lot seeds move around with people as in areas where people use them as as a food and not just for growing as well yeah. Plus, um, uh, you know, these are artificial political boundaries. So there's no cultural real boundary if in, 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 in meaningful terms, cannabis wise, between uh, the Hindu Kush in Pakistan and the Hindu Kush in Afghanistan, you know. Yeah. So I, I want to try to kind of avoid being sort of bitchy as far as possible. But there's all this stuff I see on Instagram with people talking about the Durand line and stuff. and. Yeah. like the Durand line is this it's just this 
fucking bizarre to me as well because I think most of the kids who are doing this are like Asian as well. So it's like the Durand line was just Durand was just some cunt from the UK who drew a pencil line across the boundary between Pakistan and Afghanistan. You know, yeah. the fuck has that yeah. got to do with anything? You know, yeah, and really and, and and it, it, it's only in the last kind of ten years that um, uh, they've actually really started policing that border and putting fences up and things. And even then, it doesn't make the blindest fucking bit of difference. Anyone who really yeah. wants to get things across it can still do it. Sure. But it, in cannabis terms, it's just fucking meaningless. I mean, and 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 seeds have been, you know, uh, seeds have been moved from Afghanistan down to places like Tira Valley in Pakistan. Mm-hmm. You know, there's there's plenty of local stories about the various kind of Dervish, like Kalanda Sufi type saint characters who are sort of credited with bringing seeds into Tira and things, and 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 um, which Tira is one of the big cultivation valleys in Pakistan. And yeah, this this whole area is, is seamless, seamless with this, the whole reason the politics and the history is the way it is is because it's uh, impossible to police these mountain borders, you know. Oh, I'm sure. Uh, there's huge smuggling between these places, and then. Uh, Chitral is another one of the famous uh, areas like Yakun and uh, Valley and things up in the Hindu Kush. These all lead into Xinjiang. These are the trade routes that you would take from Xinjiang, which is the Eastern Central Asian area, this Turkic area of, of uh, politically it's inside what's now China. And this was a, the biggest hash producing uh, region in, in the world for, oh, wow. For centuries. Oh, absolutely. I mean, this was the epicenter of hash production. So it wasn't Afghanistan or Pakistan. It was Xinjiang was until the 19, late 1930s was the absolute fucking epicenter of world hash production. I mean, thousands and thousands of tons of hash were being moved from these places across the mountain passes into the into India because all the money was in northern India. Yeah. And, and the demand for these products was in northern India in these huge cities, which even in the late 19th century, places like Lahore and Delhi had millions of, well, Lahore certainly had, in, which is the big Punjabi city, had, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten million people or whatever, even in the 1860s. Yeah. Whatever. So these were massively, massive centers of demand for these products. And so they, the, the production was all happening in eastern Central Asia, so in Xinjiang and um, you know, the British were trying to make sure as much of what came into India was being taxed effectively. They didn't want too sure. much smuggling. And, um, you know, the seeds were moving around between these places. You can read about the people who were responsible for uh, a lot of the uh, initiation of, like, commercial production in in, um, in Xinjiang for India were often Indians or uh, uh, ethnically, eth- from ethnic groups of, of the mountains of Pakistan, you know. So the, there's just not um, um, much basis for assuming that there's going to be a, you know, there's there's a very nuanced picture if you're talking about the diff- how, how these land races in these regions are differentiated from each other. Yeah. Once you get into Pakistan in the northern mountains, there probably is a certain degree of mixing between kind of the more sativa type. Um, mm-hmm. the, the, the further south you move away from the southern edges of Central Asia, the further south you get away from the Hindu Kush, there probably is more, there is a, a higher likelihood that you're going to have a degree of intermixing with more monsoony type, tropical type. Punjabi type populations, uh, so you know more hybridization between sativa type populations and indica type populations. Sure. The further north you go into, uh, I don't know, into places like Xinjiang, there's a higher likelihood, I guess, of it being a, a sort of quotes pure indica type. You know, so if you look at the plants that were brought back from Xinjiang in the early 20th century by people like Frank Meyer and stuff for the USDA. They definitely mm-hmm. are very indica looking um, plants. And um, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, um, you have some of those pictures on your blog too, correct? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. And, and um, uh, you know, there, mm, there's no question that there are these distinct, Types, you know, the confusion of the confusion with the discussion about are there such things as indicas and sativas is like 
Yes, there definitely are in terms of if you're looking at pure land races, yeah. real land races. Um, there are these clearly distinct types. There's also, of course, some integrating between them, even in pure land races. Some, yeah. some land races are likely to have arisen through mixing of these types. Uh, but of course, once you move into the context of what you're going to find at most dispensaries or seed banks, uh, like cannabis internet seed banks, that is, yeah, most of what you're going to find is, is a indicative sativa hybrid. So this yeah. terminology becomes meaningless in, in often most of the time in those contexts, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, but and yeah, and that's the an important point too, like, especially, uh, from people that in, in the U S that can go to collectives and stuff. And they're seeing Indica hybrid sativa and they feel like they have a pretty good working knowledge of what, what each is. And, um, quite often, I mean, I don't really see anything too narrow leaf yeah. anywhere, you know, or no, yeah, not at all. It's a, it's a problem because, um, um, that's how cannabis goes extinct, you know, yeah. Biodiversity in cannabis primarily disappears through hybridization. You know? Yeah. So uh, this impulse that most people have to like hybridize everything when they, because it is fun, you know, so like see what happens. Oh, sure. Yeah. Uh, it, actually, the most exciting thing you can do really these days, especially, is to actually keep some pristine lines going that you haven't outcrossed, because that's the basis of uh, everything really. And once people got to a point where all we've got are hybridized lines then it becomes impossible to to do breeding well, it doesn't have to become impossible but you can't make true f1 cultivars and stuff. Yeah. what have you noticed or ha maybe you haven't noticed or uh as far as in those uh regions of like afghanistan and pakistan i've noticed there's a lot of people popping up especially on instagram as instagram became bigger uh, especially for cannabis and and seeds um, yeah. do you, have you noticed a lot more hybridization involved, like with modern lines t kind of working their way into these lines that are being declared pure or, you know, have you noticed any I, of that at all? I sort of don't, um, I generally try and like, just ignore most of the, the sort of people doing those things. Yeah. Um, but every, every couple of years, I'll sort of maybe get curious about what they might be saying. And it's always, I mean, the thing is, I don't like, uh, I, I don't really know what they're up to. Uh, for the most part, um, it worries me because I suspect most of them based on what I've heard, um, have been involved in also bringing hybrid seed over to places as well. You know, yep. yeah, I can't substantiate that beyond some forum things I saw in like 2018 and the, when there was suddenly there was a 2018 ish there was this sort of big yes realization among some of these characters that um oh we can get seeds from these places but at the same time they were sort of wanting to there was certainly some of them were wanting to bring seeds up to places like Parvati and Milana the sort sure. of typical Himalayan areas for 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 for, for Charis in India and um yeah and then i saw these ridiculous kind of excuses being made oh there's some kind of wind wind uh climate type microclimate to do with winds that means that any pollen from hybrids that we bring up to milano is is not gonna <laughs> just, just <laughs> fucking as myself just shit you can imagine and and yeah. it just uh, just after that as i said i think it, I wrote a kind of couple of sort of irritated things back then on the, on the, on the, on that old blog and about the, the amount of bullshit that's spouted and, and then just thought, oh, fuck it, it's just going to put me in a bad mood. So I, I, I don't like going on social media anyway much. It tends to put me in a negative state of mind anyway. So I, I, I just have chosen to ignore it and do, do my own thing really. So I can't give anyone an informed opinion about what sure. exactly is going on. I, up to a point, I know certain outfits have like stolen stuff from people who supply me, as in, as in, like yeah. they've supplied. Like I know, I know one outfit that one of the guys who supplies me has sent seeds to, then they didn't pay him, and they just knocked off his strain and sold the seeds and kept the money for themselves. Yeah. Um. So I know there's outfits that are that shitty. Yeah. But sure. that's 
that's like I can only um, I only know that because it's in, intruded on my world, as it were. I haven't sort of proactively been seeking out knowledge of what they get up to because it's just <laughs> it's not it's not conducive to being in a in a positive state of mind to involve yourself sure. with bullshit. But um, no, I mean, I mean, it, 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 to go back to the plants and stuff, like. Um, one thing I think is probably worth clarifying for people, um, Himalayan uh, land races, as in we're talking between sort of, you know, Nepal and Kashmir are a distinct group themselves, right? They're not Indicas, they're not true tropical sativas, they're a, yeah. another kind of group within land races that's very clearly distinct, you know? They're much taller plants. They generally are triple use, multi purpose plants. So they're for seeds, for fiber, and for um, hashish, charis. Uh, they're not, um, you know, they have a, the cannabinoid profile is typically like a Central Asian, you know, the, a field of them will break down into like type one, type two, and type three cannabinoid profiles, mm -hmm. chemotypes. So they're a very distinct group. and the problem with people bringing Dutch and, and um, genetics up to Milana and stuff is you can see it's just uh, that around that area is very obviously not the same as it was even when I first went there, you know? Yeah. So it's uh, very clear that there's that skunky Dutch kind of, effect uh, as not just a, uh, not just the smell the sort of effect it's yeah um uh i was i was there um one time and this uh, real kind of crazy old timer guy turned up who'd bought a bunch of like thai brickweed with him in his <laughs> from, from the, flown from bangkok to india with like oh my goodness a, like a couple of hundred gram like brick of weed from like Kochang or somewhere, Kochang and, and just a maniac, you know, but anyway, he had a bunch of it with him in this guest house and it was very interesting, like smoking some of that, uh, uh, side by side with the, the, a lot of what you could find in, in money Quran and places at that point. Yeah. And this is like at least 10 years ago. And you know, the effect of the, the stuff from around, that end of Parvati, there'd been so much Dutch stuff brought in by that point. The smell of it was like that real kind of skunky, pissy, ur mm -hmm. urinal aroma. And then the, the, it was a very un-euphoric buzz compared to what I associate with that area. And then you smoke the Thai stuff and it was really kind of up and zingy. And then the, the you know, uh, yeah, it just really stood out. like. Similarly, if you if you go to areas of the Himalayas that haven't had that um, uh, introduction of foreign hybrid seed, the effect is of the charis in the sort of unfashionable bits of the Himalayas to go to is is the old school real stuff that's not been obviously fucked up. The effect of it's much nicer, you know. It's like yeah. much more uplifting and positive. Uh, feeling you know it's uh there's, there's very rarely nice. something with skunk one in it that i can smoke because it always takes me to a very specific like negative space <laughs> in my head so usually <laughs> i can pick it out uh it's taking mm -hmm. a long time but i can pretty much like yeah pick out anything that has skunk one in it there's very few exceptions that i find something i love you know that has that in it at least you know yeah. 50 percent. yeah and a lot of the anyway the the, the 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 most of the continuations of it have been selected for the sort of heavy side of it as well. So yes. it's uh, most mostly in the UK. If if you, if you get something skunk here, it's anywhere. It's going to be like a Hindu Kush skunk, Afghan skunk, whatever. Yeah. Anyway, so it's doubly like leaning that way. Anyway, but the thing the thing to bear in mind as well is that like that's not anyway the. If you look in Afghan land races themselves, Hindu Kush land races, whatever that whole zone, they're not necessarily like that. They're not necessarily sedative. Like some of them yeah. clearly are predominantly like that, but there's such a wide uh, range of uh, uh, phytochemical, you know, chemo 
type, whatever, oh, that yeah. you get in these populations that aren't going to give you that type of uh, effect as well. So there's no, we're not kind of stuck with this as long as we can actually keep the some good representations of like pristine uh, uh, land races in storage. You know, there will always be the possibility of creating new things that that actually feel good, <laughs> which is, yeah. you know, gets back to your original question of like, why did I get into this? And like, a lot of people, um, the sort of standard narrative is that you know, in the UK, the standard narrative is oh. Around the, around the year 2000, suddenly all this hybrid stuff arrived and it was just too strong. And it's like, not really. I wouldn't say it was too strong was the issue. The effect was just it wasn't very fucking nice, you know, yeah. for, for a lot of it. So a lot of people didn't stop smoking because it was too strong so much as it, it was just a dysphoric effect from so much of it compared to what they were used to from the, the traditional stuff, you know? Yeah. So mostly what people people say oh yeah it used to make me paranoid and stuff and it's like the assumption is that that's um because it's just too strong but it, it's not necessarily that you can have very strong tropical sativas that um prim 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 primarily don't make you feel particularly paranoid you know yeah by yeah, absolutely yeah yeah um, no that's that's a good point <laughs> yeah. yeah um <laughs> i don't think that's widely talked about either that's a no, it's just it was, short it, it was it's it's just too strong. That's why I don't smoke. It's like, well, actually, you can have a plenty of you know strong uh, highs of cannabis that are, uh, uh, are really nice. You know, yeah, they don't evoke <laughs> the paranoia and all that other shit. Yeah, general kind of grabby, dirty feeling that you kind of get. yeah. But I mean, it's not. You know, I, again, I, 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 I'm always very wary of talking myself into a corner of being kind of anti-modern stuff, which I'm not at all. I just, uh, I, I'm, I'm just pro kind of pro diversity, pro um, possibility, which is why, I, why I think it's worth preserving as much as we can of what there is left of of these things, so that there is that option in the future of taking the plant down different Absolutely. routes. There's this this a sort of default assumption that we've already arrived at the pinnacle of what can be achieved in cannabis that was so much a part of the last ten years of cannabis discourse. This assumption that's like, yeah, you know, these elite cuts and stuff are like the yes. best vegan. It's like, no. Not at <laughs> I'm all. Never sure, but sure as fuck aren't like the all there is to, to be a, to be achieved, you know. Yeah, I try to explain to people a lot of the quote unquote elite cuts in the US, like most of those are picked out of two, three seeds, you know, <laughs> like yeah. in someone's closet. <laughs> like, in, yeah. it's not, yeah. I mean, elites definitely, uh, <laughs> it's very rare that I find any of those old clones that have been passed around that everyone universally agrees. That's fucking amazing. It's so rare mm -hmm. to ever find mm -hmm. that, you know, there's very few. So, yeah, I, the, the clone market in the US has been completely taking over lately and with that spreading of hlv so a lot of like the past few seasons of what i've been doing is trying to explain to people the necessity of seeds versus clones as well in the u.s and mm -hmm. i know that a bunch of the spanish seed or spanish clones or stuff from here that went over there has murdered some of the libraries over there of some of the old dutch stuff that they had been keeping um right so it's right, not slowing right. down <laughs> it's not slowing down anytime soon and with, so, so that's very interesting. I didn't. I wasn't yeah. aware that, that this is the hop latent viroid. Yes. So, so it's just basically fucked everything up. Oh, it's so bad. We're a scenario where we're, we're paying the price of how fucking homogenous all of our yep. stuff is already. Yeah, fuck man. Yeah, it's. it's I mean, bad. I mean, I didn't talk about it, but I hadn't realized it had actually got to the point of like trashing people's collections as well. Oh yeah. yeah. Um, with yeah. one of the bigger clone nurseries that I know of and they'll re remain nameless, but um, yeah. they are pretty content with 3% of clones going out with HLV because it's so inundated. Right. Just, oh. It's assumed that 3% is, is the best that they can do. Not 0%, but 3% is like when you are constantly mm -hmm. testing, constantly, because they're still bringing stuff in because everybody wants this cookies renamed, whatever the new name for cookie <laughs> stuff is today, you know? And... <laughs> And it's still working on people, obviously. Um, the education is out there, but it's it's 
not being accessed or maybe, you know, it, there's a big difference between smokers and growers. There's a, there's a wide yeah. pool that just, it's really hard to get through because most people that I've encountered here, the attitude is, why do you care so much? It's just weed, you know? And, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, Bridging, like that, that's like a very standard British attitude. It's like, it's all just <laughs> weed. Yeah. yeah. It's like, yeah. Yeah. I, 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 like, um, Americans coming over to the UK are just like, uh, you know, when they see what's available to someone who is just uh, randomly turning up in England, it's, it's dismal, you know? Yeah, Even right. these days, unless you grow for yourself and or you happen to be in a city that's particularly like we orientated, it's very, very dismal, you know? Yeah. But yeah, I mean, I, 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 that's, that's, this, this is what I've always had in mind is that, you know, there, there is going to come a point and I had, run across the hlv issue but it's not something that impacts me directly with the way i'm operating so i haven't been looking into it but i yeah, there's always you know, there's going to come a point where something is going to come along that's just going to fucking decimate um the, the situation and people are going to realize just how fucking homogenous everything is and, and yes. it's so based on such a small handful of for the most part um you know uh, Dutch and American lines, you know, this, you could probably yeah. count them on two hands. I expect the main contributors oh, yeah. to the, and, and, um, and, and, and people don't, people, especially sort of below generation X don't really have any sense of that. I think, unless they're nerds, you know? Yeah. They have like, deep nerds. Yeah. Up, <laughs> yeah. Unless you grew up in, in the sort of pre hybrid, Era no. or happen to be into interested in the actual growing side of it, there's no reason why you'd necessarily realize, you know. Yeah, it, for sure. it's one of the problems as well. Um, with uh, uh, groups who are doing collecting, it's a lot of them I, I can tell are not from an age, uh, from a generation where they're necessarily even going to know um, what a pure land race looks like in thailand or cambodia or whatever yeah you know something that to me would be so obvious that it's been hit with something dutch or american that genuinely might not even realize that, how, that it i've had people contact me saying hey i'm in you know cambodia or whatever i found these great plants and it's like yeah they do look like pretty cool plants but i can tell from just a photo yeah. that they're, <laughs> they're not um lacking in uh, afghan <laughs> yeah for sure and uh people just don't realize you know they're yeah. still they're still worth collecting so it's but it, it does it does matter the difference between them and the pristine population does matter you know yeah um there's no reason like why they're that they're not like bad per se it's just that they they are introgressed they're they're down the route of total homogenization they're well down that route already and they're not not even half as valuable as the real thing, you know. Absolutely. Um, yeah. That's well put. Yeah. So uh, you have a lot of experience with uh, I, I don't know, maybe Southeast Asian is correct <laughs> with uh, Thai and Laos. I've I've heard you know some of the stories that uh, it was Laotian farmers bringing down stuff to Thailand. Is um, is there any veracity to that or? Um, it's more the, um, the, um, I mean, the, the thing to bear in mind is again, like it's, it's, it's really important, like really worth, um, bearing in mind is that these political boundaries, yeah. uh, are, are, are very modern creations for the most part that don't have any real significance in terms of, and the culture of the plant. So. Anyway, if you picture the if you picture the the Mekong kind of running from up in sort of the east of Tibet down into Southeast Asia from you know through the Golden Triangle and down through yeah. Thailand and Laos down towards Cambodia, all along the Mekong either side of the Mekong is is basically ethnic Lao anyway. Once you get into Thailand and and Laos, so uh, large chunks of Thailand are like Isan where which is the famous, the famous Thai stick areas of, of yeah. Thailand are all ethnically Lao anyway. So 
it wasn't really a question of people bringing seeds. I don't think it's just that the culture um, existed. Yeah, and um, if you look at the early historical uh, writing, insofar as there is any in um, Thailand about cannabis, um, I think there's some from the sort of 18th century or 19th, I think really more 19th century, some of the earliest references that I've seen people find found uh, to ganja and cannabis in Thai literature. It, the, 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 the Thai writers are very much emphasizing that this is a Lao thing. So this was in the context, one of the really early references is in the context of a kind of historical epic, uh, which is a, about the uh, huge war between the Lao uh, kingdom and the Thais that happened um, basically I think it was the 1830s, maybe I got it. I don't quote me on the dates, but not super long ago. But anyway, um, the Lao Kingdom's got quite expansionists uh, under a guy called Zhao Anyuang, I think it was. They got ambitious, tried to sort of seize bits of Lao, and in return, the Thais basically just annihilated uh, Vientiane and all the big cities of, oh, wow. of Lao, particularly, like literally razed it to the ground moved all of the population into Isan, into Thailand, across the Mekong, and uh, because they wanted to have more people there, because it was one of the big problems the Thais have always had is that the population density was too low for them to uh, sort of uh, tax farm the, they, they wanted more people there to tax basically. Yeah, it makes sense. For, for the state to, to grow. And um, yeah, so it was a kind of, um, the, the reason there's a very big Lao population in Isan is, is partly artificial, basically. So it's a lot of people moved. And um, the, um, the the culture from a very early, the, all the indications are is that the ca cannabis is associated in Thai culture with uh, rural um, populations, particularly ethnic Lao populations. Mm -hmm. And there's a very, very strong uh, status association in the in uh, it's, Thai culture is very very status conscious. Like it's worse than the English or any kind of snobby culture yeah. <laughs> yeah. you can choose. So the, all of the politics of, of Thailand are all about the big city Bangkok versus mm -hmm. the, the the countryside basically. And so this the reason I'm giving all of this kind of context is that. It's not surprising to me at all, as someone who knows these various fairly well, it's not surprising to me that the law has been changed back in Thailand now to ban cannabis again. Oh, is so it? That's... Did they change it back? Yeah, yeah. So they're oh, going to, by the, sometime this, I forget, they've got a, a few more months, or, or perhaps, and then they're going to just ban recreational use again. It's another question about whether they'll actually be able to enforce that sure. but um, at this stage, but the absolutely no surprise to me at all whatsoever that the, 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 the consensus has been that in, in the Bangkok elite that uh, this should not be allowed uh, and they're going to do what the British have done, they're going to basically copy our model of like allowing some medicinal industry that them and their mates will get mm -hmm. to cash in on so the kind of industrialists and elite will get to make a killing out of the medicinal industry but and everyone else can go fuck themselves and get a prescription or go to jail, you know? It's so, not much different than the US. Like, if you don't yeah. miss, it really is yeah. how it ended up. Yeah. Um, so it's the same, it's the same sort of whatever dialectic, whatever you want to say, just because it's basically cannabis is a, is a, is a, is a peasant drug basically in, yeah. to put it in the bluntest terms in, mm -hmm. in Thailand. Yeah. Now that means that some people have a, some elite, establishment types have a kind of affectionate attitude towards it. It's like, oh, it's the country bumpkin kind of thing. Other people look down on it, disdain for it. Sure. And there's the definite hierarchy, you know, in terms of things like amphetamine and, and opiates and stuff in Southeast yeah. Asia that's that about elite versus rural, poor man's drug, rich man's drugs and various sure. in between. Yeah. Um, and cannabis is definitely the poor man's drug, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so wild. 
Yeah. It's um, fucked up. But it's, we always, it we always assume that it's like, oh, it's part of the culture, quote unquote, but it's much more complicated than that in Asia. And you need to have a kind of sense of how stratified and fractured all of these countries are <clears throat> in terms of the culture and the geography <clears throat> and how that relates to, to cannabis. It's, it's not straightforward, you know, it's not straightforward that <clears throat> they're going to legalize in India by any means. Um, yeah. And it, it's very strongly connected to how <clears throat> the um, political establishment relate towards the uh, minorities and, and village communities in terms of how they see it. And there's all kinds of complicated ideas about smoking versus eating it and which is okay. smoking is generally not okay and maybe eating it's kind of okay and da, 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 da. It's, all, it's so it's so it's not at all the question that it's like um the shorthand that we in the west tend to go for like uh the americans came and banned it and da, 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 da. it's like yes and but no not really it, there were moves to ban these things long before the um uh American hegemony or whatever was a yeah. thing, and 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 a lot of the 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 um, British involvement, ironically, was strongly lent towards not making it illegal because the British were there to make money in in India yeah. and places, and the, the loudest voices who were pushing for it to be made illegal were generally Indians, yeah, of a certain establishment type of in of mentality in India that regarded this stuff as unacceptable you know and that was nothing to do with uh, them being contaminated by puritanical western ideas these were like locally born ways of thinking about these substances that associated them with undesirable groups like cannabis was very strongly associated with muslim culture in india for example uh, particularly the smoking hashish was associated with muslims yeah and then in as far as it had any Hindu connections, it was associated often with village forms of Hinduism that were seen as being um, sort of folk versions of Hinduism that were not sophisticated and or, or were contaminated with, um, uh, uh, you know, unorthodox forms of Hinduism that were disapproved of, you know. So there's all kinds yeah. of like nuances in there in terms of it. Um, you know, it's not as pessimistic but i can't i'm not like anticipating some glorious future age of legalization that's going to be around the corner unfortunately there was a yeah. while where i thought hey, maybe maybe because the money will decide it and then i'm like oh uh, no it's not it's not gonna i don't think we're gonna be like living in some global legal situation anytime soon basically yeah it, it just seems like no matter what happens it's always going to be putting the hand the the money into the hands of the few so maybe opening it up you know built this market but closing yeah. it back down puts it back into the one percent type situation yeah. yeah yeah it's it's pretty difficult once yeah basically i think so and once it's been once you've got a prohibition scenario like extricating yourself from that you know it's not straightforward especially when there's such a strong plutocratic sort of oligarchical yeah. tendency in 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 our dysfunctional democracies these days it's like when you combine that with how difficult it is to have a sensible discussion about these types of topics in the in the media these days it's uh it's yeah it's, it's very tricky you know yeah for sure yeah i mean there's people in the usa that you know applied for licenses and because and didn't end up getting it for whatever reason and then yeah. now they're on paper and now they get rated like <laughs> it's yeah it's it's been wild yeah. to watch it happen over the past you know however many years and uh i can't imagine it's going to get any better anywhere after people have watched the rich sort of take over the whole industry yes i mean i i don't know like um I, I, I was very sort of not optimistic, but I was kind of cautiously optimistic that like, even if it wasn't for the right reasons, we might end up with legalization. Sure. Um, because, uh, you know, and, and, and the quirks of the political system in the States where you can have these sort of referenda and stuff, referendums in places like Oregon or whatever that mm -hmm. we don't have anything like that in the UK equivalent to that. So, 
I was sort of watching somewhat enviously and thinking, yeah, well, it's only a matter of time before you've got federal legalization. And I noticed Harris has been saying she's going to do that and things. Who knows? You know, I mean, maybe they will, but it does require like some courage on the part of um, people in power to actually do what they know. I mean, all of it, talk to any of these people, they will know what they should do. And, but they'll always do sort of some sort of half hearted fudge Absolutely. in the end. You know? I, I mean, like, you know, the chance of like having sensible laws about actually kind of properly dangerous drugs is is very unlikely anytime soon. And, and particularly given that even the sort of more enlightened discourse around these things is is so um, incapable of, you know, like I'm thinking like you see all this talk about psychedelics these days and psychedelics oh, yeah. this and psychedelics that. And it's like, yeah, okay, but you know, oh, we're gonna just we're gonna go we're gonna go and legal these things, legalize all these things, and then we're gonna leave like the actual shit like fentanyl and heroin and meth or whatever that <laughs> right. actually is really where you need to change the law. <laughs> yeah, uh, if you're actually concerned about not having all these people dying and stuff, uh, but yeah, it's like uh, you know, um, cannabis excep exceptionalism, psychedelic exceptionalism, and all this stuff is like. Uh, is a whole is a whole other conversation, but um, I don't see it's going to feature anytime soon in the sort of any 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 serious discussions. Basically, you know, I, I just recently learned that in Oregon, um, because someone got busted there, um, seeds seed sales and stuff is is a serious felony if you do, if you're not like you know fully legal with paperwork and everything. And they, right. yeah, dude went to jail. Still in there, yeah. I, right. It kind of blew my mind because when I think of Oregon, like when I visited, um, it's it's very open cannabis wise, much more open than where I'm at in California. Mm -hmm. Obviously, like I, I'm right. in like I'm, the red yeah, area. I'm, I'm not up to speed, but yeah, it like it, it it seemed pretty. I don't know, normalized there, but uh, the seeds. If you're not legal, you know, you don't have all yeah. your paperwork in. It's a lot more serious penalties. Uh, I had no idea. In my mind. Yeah. Yeah, it's very tricky. I so sort of, so like, um, there's such a big gray area with all of this stuff. It's, uh, you know, in the UK itself, totally uncontrolled in terms of moving the seeds in and out of the country. Yeah. It's not, there's zero regulation on it, like literally none, you know? Yeah. It's, uh, um, as in to, to leave the borders of the UK and come into the UK, you know? Sure. But it, obviously for the destination countries, this becomes infinitely more complicated, but absolutely, it's, it's, it's so, um, it's, it's so, uh, it's so, so sort of surreal. The, the, this is the thing though. I mean, I, 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 I tend to repeat myself. So just steer me onto something else if I'm getting boring. But, sure. Go ahead. But the, the weird thing is with the, the UK is it's not historically actually been a country that, has tended to, to to prohibit stuff, you know. Yeah. Like uh, narco colonialism was one of the most controversial aspects of our history in terms of things like opium and and all of that. So yeah, the colonial history, imperialist history of the UK was drugs are a huge part of it. The the elite discourse of the establishment figures, you know, the sort of liberal, old school liberal kind of nineteenth yeah. century, eighteenth century liberals. For the most part, just like insofar as they knew about these things, just didn't give a fuck. It was like, well, that's something they do there. Can we make money out of it? Yes. Yep. Can we tax it? Yes. Great. You know. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> now, subject. You know. And then um, in 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 the UK itself, like uh, you know, heroin was available on prescription as late as the the nineteen nineteen late nineteen sixties. You know, you could so still. Wild. Yeah. Yeah, and and um, it was regarded as a as a Opiate addiction was a medical thing. The, the notion that it should even be considered criminal was completely just anathema to the whole yeah. way it was dealt with, you know? Um, so, you know, people like William Burroughs and all these kind of beat type characters would come to the UK and stuff, you know, because it was oh, yeah. so, because it was such a common sense culture towards these things, you know? Yeah. But then they obviously went like off the rails dramatically by the seventies. Uh, yeah. And, yeah. Um, partly for actually kind of historical reasons, not necessarily to do with America per se, but it was, you know, largely sort of American led, the 
the the move towards a more aggressive pro- prohibitionist stance. Yeah. But it, it um yeah, I mean uh it, you know, you, even our sort of, I think it's probably the same in the States now, like, it doesn't matter how far right you go, really, most people in, in the conservative politics in the UK will, will, if you talk to them on a personal basis, and even publicly now, would be like, yeah, of course it shouldn't be criminalized, you know, it should be yeah. legal, you know, everything, you know, but... Um, yeah, that's wild, so much different than the US. I mean, I maybe maybe politicians on the right would... <laughs> Say that privately, but definitely not publicly. <laughs> definitely mm. not. I don't know if it's a it's a religious thing because our country is so religious. Sorry, sorry, what's that? Yeah, I'm not sure if it's a religious thing because our country is so religious based, or or what the difference yeah. is there. I mean, it was definitely one of the major um, d- d- dividing lines between the U.S. and the U.K. was that there was a strong disapproval of of uh, British imperialism, particularly in Asia. Yeah. You know, in World War II, the Americans were just very openly like, why the fuck should we even be helping you guys keep control of your colonies? You know, ignoring the yeah. hypocrisy of the Philippines and whatever. Yeah. But, but um, the attitude was that... Uh, and, and 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 it was uh, even before then at the League of Nations when the first kind of international attempts at prohibition happened. We're talking kind of 1920s and stuff. Um, it was the Americans and the Egyptians who led the move to kind of include cannabis on all of the um, anti-opiate laws, which were the real driver of the first attempt to like internationally prohibit drugs through the League of Nations, sort of pre-UN type idea. Yeah. The, it was the Americans and G- Egyptians who were really led the charge, especially to get cannabis included on the on the laws. And that, ironically, that was using data from the um, quotes lunatic asylums of, of Egypt that the British had actually put together because there were kind of doctors and stuff within the imperialist machinery who were focused on this idea that cannabis caused insanity and that it was yeah. associated with criminality and stuff. So. It was partly British material, like the research that supported the idea was was used to support the idea that cannabis might somehow make you insane or was associated with violence and criminality. Yeah, basically because the British, even though they didn't want to ban these things in in India, were were still quite happy to use the association between cannabis and like marginal groups. You know, groups of men hanging out on street in in parks and in urban centres, like labourers and stuff, smoking cannabis. Oh, what are you doing? Uh, you know, they were quite happy to kind of police these groups using, um, or you know, to, to control these groups using cannabis. You know, so some kind of radical dervish gets conscripted into some army unit and it's causing problems in the barracks so he smokes hash he's insane put him in the yeah. lunatic asylum you know what i mean <clears throat> so they were still using it was still exploiting it to control undesirable people you know yeah so there yeah. was this kind of paper trail associating cannabis with the um, mental illness that was used as early as the 1920s to <clears throat> to kind of shoehorn cannabis into the anti-opium laws um wild yeah <clears throat> I could dig into this with you forever, but I I definitely want to make sure that we go over some of what you have in stock because. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, I'd love to have you on, you know, whenever you have more time too, because I, like I said, each one of these topics, like you, you could really open it up and talk about it forever. And this is uh, what fascinates me. Uh, It's it's just what I know least about. Yeah, far away, like because it, it's better if you sure. if you give me some questions so that I don't just drift back onto stuff that some people would have heard me talk about before. So, yeah. so the um, let's start with uh, one of the ones I had experience with was from uh, the Highland Thai Burmese, I think it was called when it was first released. Yeah, that one's. I thought that was an amazing like uh, plant that could be done well indoor. I don't know how it would compare to you know point of origin but it could be done well indoor in the usa 
Um, what can you tell me about that line? Um, so that um, has been through a couple of like ex situ maintenance grows now. Um, mm -hmm. So it's gonna. I and I haven't directly been involved with that since I originally collected the seeds. So <clears throat> any there may have been inevitably going to have been some possible shifts in w what it actually is now, just from the fact that, you know, we can't do more than like double digits yeah. in terms of plant numbers of maintaining it realistically. So um, <clears throat> I got it from uh, in, in Mae Hong Son from a guy who, um, uh, an expat guy who was based up sort of, you know, very near the, border with Burma and there were hill tribe groups um, uh, who had got hold of seeds and yeah. it's difficult to know like I, I hopefully will be finding out soon based on genomics analysis of it what exactly is in the mix but I suspect it may have a bit of hybridization with more like kind of East Asian hemp lines in there okay. not, not just a, a pure um, it's not like a simple kind of pristine ganja uh, land race. Um, yeah. I just, uh, but there's a, a Tai Yai, like Shan, it's another name for them, kind of groups up in those areas who definitely have a culture of, of growing cannabis for themselves sometimes. Like it was a real problem for uh, this friend of mine, or rather, you know, not friend of mine, but a guy I, I, I met who was um, growing up there. He, he would do these kind of gorilla grows yeah. with uh, tropical, you know, really nice, like tropical lines, like kind of a Kerala haze and stuff. And then they get, the plants would get to like, you know, within like a couple of days of just being just right, you know, and he goes out to cut them down and he just finds some Shanghai has come and just <laughs> taken the whole lot, you know, like exactly when it's just like a point, you know, he's like, oh, fuck. That's so brutal. <laughs> Because they really know exactly how to grow it themselves, so they're like yeah, um, sure. they're waiting for the the perfect moment, <laughs> like the day before he goes out to to get them and take the whole fucking lot. That's but, what um, always scared me about gorilla grows. Is is yeah? You know, they like here they say plant one for you, plant one for the cops, plant one for the thieves. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Th thieving is is not great, but. It, it's what it is it's just the the um but yeah so i think they were lahu the actual guys he got the seeds from that lahu kind of like a or musa is another name for them they're like kind of a minority group who uh are, are around those border regions a lot they're like you know hill tribe would be the kind yeah. of term people would use they and they move across the borders between china and burma and Laos and places quite readily uh and uh i think they were growing and it got hold of some seeds but the thing is around there there's a quite a lot of um cultivation of uh fiber types land races as well in those areas particularly because it's been encouraged by the thai government so mm -hmm. there's just quite a high chance that there's been hybrid hybridization between them like my experience of it was it was not like a highly potent compared to what you can have in land races yeah yeah and then the very tall plants as well plus the hollow stem t tendency made me think yeah. like quite possibly there's some hybridization happened and there's certainly other lines where that's plausible that that's happened because they are sure. grown on the same grow cycles as the hemp and hemp and and, and, and and ganja are grown on the same grow cycles quite often in those areas so there's possibility of pollen crossing between populations it's, it's so and i was just thinking about it like um asking you to explain any of the scent profiles and stuff like that but it, it really doesn't translate like because like you said it's a very plastic uh you know um, i wouldn't want to that in the sense that like um it, it, the nuance is so hard to get right i mean yeah um when i saw them like he deliberately had brought down like to the two kind of main expressions of that mm -hmm. entire land race that, I mean, 
it may be something totally different from what the high and tie that goes around in America under the same name, by the way, it was probably, I shouldn't have used that name for it because it just adds to the confusion, but he brought down like a, a, very, a much more kind of a light green and the pur- there was a light green and the purple batch yeah. of the same land race. And the purple batch was much more kind of down the mango carroty end mm-hmm. of the smell of smell types. And then the light green I much preferred was more kind of like, it's really hard to describe, but it was sort of citrus, but not like straightforwardly. It was like very kind of musky. Um, uh, it's very hard to describe smells, but it was a much yeah. more compelling smell for me. And I'm sure would be the preference if I was working the line was that, that side of it. Sure. Um, uh, but, you know, um, the other thing, the reason I suspect some Chinese hemp type, East Asian hemp type, is the the leaves um, could be very um, broad, not not like yeah. not like with the the indica shape per se necessarily. Although you know, I need I, I need to actually look at them again to see where the broadest point is on them. But the but they just anyway look like something quite distinct from the real kind of classic Lao Isan Thai type. Um, Yeah, so most of these uh, questions we've actually covered as a course of just conversing. Um, Yeah. There's one, I mean, like almost all of them we covered (laughs) just by conversing. But one one that I think will be probably the most asked question you'd probably, when you get a lot, is from a Hmm. CCC. And he asked how to keep pure, well, pure, relatively pure uh, sativas manageable indoors. Do you have any advice on that? Um... I mean, one of the main um, tricks people do that I'm aware of is um, uh, you can use pot size to just control and 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 like because uh, if it's really like a pure straight from a farmer type sativa, it's it's they're going to keep rooting even during flowering, you know. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> you can just pot up in the kind of second week of flower or so still and you should find that the it will still root into the new compost uh, mm. which can be good as well because it can mean that you don't make the mistake of like overfeeding too much during flower Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> and the other thing uh with sativas indoors is to try to not over water them like it's a really important aspect of of traditional farming of, of ganja, you know, since me or whatever is, uh, the right irrigation schedule. So m- even these days, um, the good quality, uh, production in places like Laos and stuff is in areas where they've got access to lakes or ponds or streams to irrigate on schedule rather than just allowing rain fed, um, yeah, you know, uh, dictated. Right. Yeah, so in other words, the, the main good quality crop is done from sort of sowing in mid-August-ish and then harvesting kind of fe- February-ish. So you um, uh, September-ish or whatever to, to February, March-ish, basically six months over the starting at the end of monsoon so you can have a bit of rain whilst the plants are in veg, but really once you're into flower, you're looking to like have zero rain ideally and yeah. just have irrigation. And the mistake people make indoors is to overwater. So we've already kind of touched on that. But um, the other thing is you can, if they're a real land race, you can prune back pretty fucking heavily if, if you want. And you can, you can, you can um, concentrate the uh, bud production into the exactly where you, one, if you pr- prune carefully, and you can prune like quite late on in the cycle of growth, still. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, uh, I can't think of other things. To be honest with you, I'm not like an expert grower. I just know from talking to people and, and stuff. Yeah, like, for sure. I, I, I don't have like a huge amount of opportunities to grow because of the amount of moving around I do, you know? Yeah, yeah, um, I can imagine. That makes it yeah. hard. Yeah. I, um, Anyway, I yeah, it's uh, but yes, yeah, so, sativas they're not well adapted to in indoors. Basically, as the bottom <laughs> bottom yeah, line, you know, the bottom line, for they sure. really want to be outside. And 
they will, um, <clears throat> you know, the, the the type of land they want to be on is a, is a really important consideration. So in the big ganja growing areas of India um, in the late 19th, early 20th century, there was quite a good documentation done of that whole economy because it was economically very significant. Um, <clears throat> and um, the land along the rivers, along the Ganges Delta area that was very loamy, like light, sandy loams yeah. that don't hold water too much, but are very nutrient rich, were really sought after by uh, people who wanted to, to, to get into commercial production, you know? Yeah. And um, there were techniques which are still used of, of how you prepare the land. <clears throat> so, you know, still they'll do this still in, in Southeast Asia as you um, create um, uh, uh, ridges, you know? like a raised raised beds like a kind of semi um circle type shape with runs between them for the water and then you plant on top of those um half circles as it were you know what i mean so yeah. uh, cur curved a uh, raised bed and uh, so that means that you the water runs off the roots <clears throat> so it, the, the thing you're just trying to avoid is for the to have the roots sitting in waterlogged um waterlogged uh land because that yeah cannabis just does not fucking like that and it will get it will get infected and there are all kinds of parasites and pathogens that were already very well known back in the in that time <clears throat> which are even cannabis specific forms of powdery mildew and stuff you know um and um you know, I, <laughs> these conversations sometimes with people who are like using these, um, what is it, nat natural um, sort of, uh, what is it, some kind of like people basically growing in this like composting compost. It's not even properly uh, composting. Like Korean natural farming stuff? Yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I get these kind of emails from people sometimes and I like I try and like be as nice as I can. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's tough. I'm like, I'm like, <laughs> On principle, I'm like all for kind of permaculture and anything like sure. that. It's like, but Jesus, man, like cannabis does not want to be in that kind of fucking situation. Yeah. This guy I, writing yeah, to I, me like, yeah, yeah I, 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 I've created this amazing system where like the soil is wet 24 seven. <laughs> it's like, yeah. man, I love that. <laughs> yeah, right. No cannabis wants to be like, they, <laughs> I mean, okay, I, with hydroponics and stuff, maybe they've, I mean, I, I think in over the last 50, 60 years, like cannabis in the West has adapted to all kinds of maltreatment, but sure, absolutely ultimately, has. Um, ultimately, yeah, you don't want to be growing a land race in like soggy, <laughs> yeah. incredibly rich compost. Yeah, that makes especially sense. Not, like, com especially not with like stuff li literally rotting on the surface. <laughs> yeah. So this yeah. guy's like, I said, can you send me like a photo? And he says he's seeing this like fucking cooch grass, like growing in, <laughs> in the same yeah. pot. They do, they do that. Yeah. <laughs> <It's weird. laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, each their own, I guess. But yeah, yeah. God so bless them. <laughs> if someone's asking my opinion, I, I feel I should just tell them like, no. <laughs> yeah, just don't grow this type. <laughs> It'll take abuse. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, um, anyway. Is there any strange you want to highlight that you currently have for sale right now, or any anything uh, else you want to talk about and get in? I mean, I'm really interested. Like, uh, and you can, um, I we collected a bunch of stuff from Arissa, which is sort of just south of of Bengal. Okay, uh, which I suspect is um, uh, quite um, historically significant um, in terms of the development of um of sativas like real tropical sensimilar land races yeah. uh you know we were talking about there's that um book the uh, or kind of uh alchemical it's an alchemical book actually the iron and the kanda is the name of it um mm -hmm. where they describe the sensimilar technique that's from around there kind of andhra pradesh uh barissa area <clears throat> was where that was probably compiled and um i suspect those plants are pretty interesting uh to look at uh they seem to be yeah. like probably more like five months from seed to harvest uh the ones we've got and um also um yeah and and then um I'm planning to have some nepali um uh ganja 
land races available soon as well, which I think will be pretty interesting. I mean, yeah. just in terms of product stuff, like I'm a big fan of the Southeast Asians, but the because of the aromas and stuff, and I think there's been a lot of hybridity between possibly like independent centers of domestication south of Yunnan with the the East Indian uh, sense of domestication. I, I don't know, this is just a hunch, but um, anyway, I think these uh, actual South Asian land races like from Orissa and Andhra Pradesh and um, the Terai regions of Nepal are, are worth checking out. So we've got already uh, some, like Dakshin Kali is the name of the one from Nepal that we've got that's <clears throat> kind of, uh, uh, you could say like, been domesticated it definitely has been domesticated for use as bud not just as hash yeah and then the original one is very much specifically for bud and um both of them i think will be really interesting to look at uh really nice aromas from them too as well you know yeah um, and types of effect are really good like very stimulating and positive um, it sounds freaking awesome <laughs> to be honest yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm quite keen to see what the genomics work discovers about them because my hunch is they're probably the uh, East India, Nepal, and East India are kind of where the sativas really originate first. We'll see. Yeah. yeah, that's so fascinating. I can't wait to see that all work out. Um, where where should people go to buy your seeds? Uh, what's the website? Um, the real seed company.com and then for the for the modern stuff is quickseeds.com it's a stupid name but it's like what i I'd, I'd originally -K -K. Planned it. yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> i'd originally planned it as like a budget thing i was just going to buy a bunch of like cheapo dutch seeds and sell it on there yeah. and it's like, oh, fuck it. i'm just don't want to get into <laughs> the, like big business stuff and so it's kind yeah. of just at speed but um yeah, that's where we've, for the time being anyway, all the, all the kind of really interesting 90s material we've got and some other, um, there's like some later 90s things like uh, Cinderella 99, Amnesia, yep. uh, which are really good, very strong as well if you're looking for like strong, uh, really strong stuff. And then some Colombian, um, um, uh, like a Colombian import, that's probably like a Northern Lights crossed with a Colombian land race, then crossed with some like um, um, uh, heirloom Colombian and Mexican things, all kinds of things yeah. like that you can find there. And a whole bunch of just like kind of fun hybrids with things like uh, Pakistan Trichal Kush crossed with like some land races, which would be great, like for just making hash and stuff and all, all for oh, bud. Absolutely. You know? Yeah. And, and very uh, nice prices for most of it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just, oh, um, yeah, fun stuff to play with if you've got the space and things. Any yeah. any way uh, you'd prefer to be contacted to if people want to reach out to you? Yeah, sure. I I, generally, um, if you want a quick response, like uh, the um, Gmail, re real seed coat at Gmail is best. Uh, you can contact me on Instagram as well, but I, sometimes I'm not on there. Like I, I, I may not get back to you as quickly, and I sometimes yeah. miss the. Um, miss the uh, incoming messages you know yeah. like uh, yeah. forget to check the request a bit sometimes so yeah always to, 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 to use this use the site contact form or, or just email me directly and, and, and that i should get back to you within like two or three days max you know awesome well i gotta say i'd love to have you back sometime when uh, time allows for you yeah. it, it's been an I, absolute I, I, pleasure yeah, I, I and 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 um, I've really enjoyed it, and it's very kind of you to give me the space to just ramble. I, I, I'm slightly fucking burned out and a bit like uh, sleep deprived. I always seem to be when I do these podcasts, but um, <laughs> maybe when I'm back in the UK, we can do another one at a more civilized. Or well, it's kind of a civilized hour now, but I'm just not a civilized person, so I've not been, <laughs> <laughs> I've been getting out of bed before. Like anyway, but. Uh, yeah. So anyway, it's been it's been good though. Yeah. Thanks, man. I've enjoyed it. I I appreciate your time, my friend, and um, I'll talk to you soon. This is going to air Friday, and uh, yeah, nice. people are going to be stoked. People are really going to dig it. I'll probably cut it into two or three parts. Yeah. Yeah. Nice one. Yeah. 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 Oh, great. Cool. I'll keep you posted on it. And and again, thank you for your time. And um, yeah, it's an honor. I really appreciate yeah, it. Thank you. Yeah. No All right, brother. I'll talk to you soon.
Yeah, cool. So is, is that, that's um, that's that. Is it like uh, yeah. the wrap? Yeah, and send me the um everything over like, and I'll as soon as you've got it all going. And oh, I'll... absolutely. Yeah, and it so and it'll it premiere on... live, and there'll be people in chat. There's usually over a hundred something people that'll watch it live. Oh, and nice. It gets a few thousand views in the first two days. Awesome. Yeah. yeah, yeah, nice. It does okay. Yeah, yeah just uh, and and so it will go on YouTube and everything. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll put it on the site as well, and, and that'll be great. I appreciate yeah. that. Nice one. All right, my friend. Right. Thank you so much, and thank you. Like seriously, thank you for your time. I know it's hard to. No, no, it. it's a pleasure. No, I can. I like. I can talk at length about this whenever. So I it's. Love uh, it. Yeah, it's uh, always. It, always I appreciate it. Nice one, man. Well, have a have a lovely evening, and and I hope it's a bit more chill than over the last few weeks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That sounds We're finally in a smooth spot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, enjoy, enjoy. All right, All right. My friend. I'll talk to you soon. Yeah. Nice one. Cheers. Cool. Bye bye. Want more Syndicate? Check out our Patreon in the description below. Thank you for joining us on this journey. We are forever thankful that enough people watch us to keep us going. With that in mind, you can show your support for the show by liking, subscribing, and sharing the show. We don't advertise, so we need you. Also, hit riotseeds.com and syndicategear.com to show more support for the show. Kick over the statues and bring it back to the farmers.